So now it's my pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Nareen Ahmed. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, thank you very much. So I have not studied her um, biography very much. She may have to correct some of my um, introduction, but the thing that impresses me uh, most, Leaf Greenslade suggested that we talk to her. Um, she is a clinician and just on Wednesday or Thursday, she was in an ICU getting her talk ready but she's also done work in low and middle income countries. So Dr. Ahmed is a um, doctor who I believe is a medical doctor who is also a professor um, and has done work in um, the kinds of setting where open source technology is going to make um, a big difference. Uh, have, I, have I said anything incorrect, Dr. Ahmed? No, you're absolutely on point. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to let her take over. I will go to the Rehive instance and then try to return in in uh, in time to have Victor Sutran introduce Dr. Gadasali. Great, thank you, Rob, um, and thank you everybody for for being here. Um, I'm extremely honored to be giving this talk today, um, and especially honored to to have sit through some of the talks before. I think um, this has been an incredible conference. Um, just to give you a little bit more background about me, uh, I'm a medical ICU doctor. I work in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania um, in the U.S. Um, but as Rob mentioned, I do a lot of global health work with some nonprofits. One of which, Med Global, uh, is also part of the Every Breath Counts Coalition. Um, and uh, and have really been able to see the impact of open source and um, the 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 need for it really during this pandemic and and that's what I'm going to kind of start out by talking to you about that uh, and really the the reason I named this talk amplifying local voices is because throughout the last two years which is hard to believe that we've been doing this for two years with the pandemic um, it's really been about the local community feeding back to those of us in healthcare um, and that has been how each of us has learned how to deal with COVID. Um, as a clinician working in a city that was hit after, um, you know, after Italy, after New York City, we learned from those local communities about how to take care of patients. And that was uh, an eye-opening experience. And I think that globally speaking, it's part of the key to combating health inequity. So I wanna start with a story which really, um, is uh, incredible. And I just will start out by saying that all images that have any patients in them were shared with permission uh, by patients or patients' families. Uh, this picture was taken several years back, uh, pre-pandemic, as you can tell, there are no masks, which is hard to see that image and, and not feel a little bit of anxiety. Um, and uh, this was a patient that came in with severe malaria complicated by a bacterial infection, and she needed uh, to get on a ventilator ASAP. Uh, what you see here is that I'm preparing to intubate the patient or place a breathing tube. Uh, in this maybe exact moment, two seconds after this image was taken, the power went out. Um, and as uh, as Debbie had kind of um, uh, had had kind of had to deal with that during her chat, um, I think this was uh, this was a, ver a very a moment of very high anxiety because it was not something I was used to. This was in Ethiopia, um, and uh, and. The team that was with me, this was something they were very used to. And immediately they knew exactly what to do. In this exact moment, another disaster happened. The oxygen cylinder that was connected to the Ambu bag uh, ran out of oxygen. Um, and, uh, and so many things went wrong in that moment, but the team that was there knew exactly what to do. And that reminded me that in low middle income settings where the resources are limited, the teams that are there have been working in that and in those environments their entire careers. They know how to work in those environments. They know how to get creative, innovative, uh, and, and listening to them is one of the most important lessons I've learned. And I learn so much more when I work in these settings uh, because I come back armed with so much knowledge about how to get innovative in the area of healthcare when we're so limited with our resources. So then fast forward a few years, um, and I thought, okay, I maybe I'll never be in a scenario again where I'll feel like resources are that limited, especially in the US, but I continued to do global health work. And so I, I knew that, you know, I, I would be in those settings abroad, but probably not ever in the US. Fast forward to the pandemic. Um, the image that you see in the top left is in one of the ICUs that I work in here in Philadelphia. Um, and I remember the day that we ran out of ventilators. And I remember thinking, uh, I cannot believe this is happening. 
I cannot believe this is happening in the US. I remember the day that somebody said we have run out of high flow nasal cannula. I remember the day that we had to decide um, who gets that the one particular intervention over the other. And I thought, this is what my colleagues in low and middle income countries with limited resources are dealing on a regular basis. Fast forward then um, several months in, I volunteered my time in Navajo Nation in Gallup, New Mexico in the US. And again, experienced what, um, the absence of resources look like uh, in an area of the country in the U again in the US um, that was limited with number of beds and hospitals, number of staff, ventilators available, all of these things. Um, and again, experiencing what that stress and anxiety and tension on a system and on people, what that looks like. And then over the last two years, I've also done a lot of, unfortunately, haven't been able to travel as much internationally, but have worked very closely with colleagues in many of the countries that I personally have worked in myself or that, that my organization, MedGlobal, works with. And one in particular was in Bangladesh at Dhaka Medical College Hospital, where I've worked uh, for several years doing a lot of capacity building in medical education and have heard the cries of my colleagues there about PPE, about lack of oxygen, uh, lack of support, um, the lack of the world knowing how bad it really is over there. Um, this image was taken with permission, but as you can see, um, this patient has a, a, a venti mask on them. Um, the limitation of ventilators in that unit was a very real feeling that happened on a daily basis. And these were these are some of the clinical stories. A lot of memes and images and art came out from the last two years that are very telling about these limitation of resources and the stress it puts on the system. This particular image really stood out to me because it really spoke to the devastation that many of us felt at the bedside, realizing that perhaps if we had more, we could do more and that patient would survive. Um, and this was uh, this image in particular um, is, I believe, how many of my colleagues abroad really felt when they ran out of resources or there maybe those resources were never available. And this image was the second image that really stood out to me. And I think, uh, again, I am kind of making this point of the impact of having access and having access to resources, access to edu medical education, and um, all of this is so important because this is the struggle. Uh, we have felt like for the last two years, um, whether I'm working here in the US or collaborating with colleagues abroad, that we are fighting to keep people alive in an era where um, you know, we, are, we are learning that uh, that our resources are not infinite. Um, and that's both human, uh, physical resources, um, you know, across the board. And that has been a very impactful experience to see and be a part of. So that leads me into um, a, the, the line from the Open Medical Technology Manifesto that I wanted to put it put into my presentation really because it spoke to me uh, and I truly support this the concept of open shareable repairable medical technology that will make us all healthier uh, I say this right now because uh, I remember going back to the um, beginning of the pandemic when we felt so blind we had no idea how to treat these patients they were coming in with a medical disease that we thought we would be able to understand. Very simple. A virus that affects the lungs, you put them on a ventilator, we know what to do. We've done that before. We've seen swine flu, we've seen the regular flu. Um, you know, we, we thought we knew how to deal with this. And then these patients showed us that we had to relearn how to practice medicine, and that was very scary. The only way we were able to move forward were to have Zoom sessions with colleagues, and these were open settings from across the globe we saw in rapid form um, papers being published, data being published and accessible to everyone, which was both a good and a bad thing. But for those of us in the medical field, it was incredible. Uh, we went from saying steroids are bad to steroids are good. This came from experience and people sharing those experiences and sharing it so openly that we were all able to benefit. And that benefit expanded into low and middle income countries as well. And not only were we sharing with them what we learned, they shared with us what they learned. And that transfer of information was so incredibly important to the ability of uh, to get to where we are right now. 
So in light of the sort of title of this, of this conference, I really want to focus on concept to impact and what that really means from a clinical setting. Um, to me, that, that looks like open source design, which is, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about that and what that means, um, really translating into patient outcomes and improving patient outcomes. So when I look at this, based on the experience that I've had working in the U.S. and in low resource settings in the United States as well as abroad, um, I first kind of focus on the barriers, and I think this is an incredible place to start and really, I think, um, lends to the conversation of how do we change the world, how do we impact uh, with open source and what comes from that. So to answer that question, I'm going to start with a, another story because I think these, these stories really lend to the impact of what we're talking about. Uh, I was working in a refugee camp in Bangladesh, um, in the Rohingya refugee camps. Um, the image at the top left is a clinic that's set atop of a, of a hill. Um, it's deep, deeply entrenched in the refugee camp, so easy for um, many of the Rohingya to reach the the clinic, but very hard to send somebody from the clinic to a hospital if needed. At the bottom left of the screen, you'll see that um, this is what the acute care area in the clinic looks like. It's quite limited. Hidden somewhere in the back there, you'll see there's an oxygen tank. Um, and I remember one day I had a patient that came in who was in respiratory distress. We were able to check a pulse ox on her. We were able to give her oxygen. I had a handheld ultrasound with me that I had brought with me from the States. I was able to tell that she likely had pretty severe pulmonary edema and heart failure. So the next step was we had to transfer her to a field hospital. The picture to the right is how she was being transferred from the acute care clinic to the street level to then get, get into an ambulance and get transferred to a field hospital. Um, the limitation that we had was providing her ambulatory oxygen. Um, so the infrastructure was limited. The actual therapeutics were limited. Um, how to actually transport the patient. Um, all of these things, all of these steps. And I thought to myself, well, you know, it would be great if we had oxygen, but one, who would know how to, who, it would be great if we had ambulatory oxygen, who would know how to use it in transport? Um, could we teach people how to provide oxygen or higher level of, or a higher level of care in this very remote clinic in order to stabilize them? Um, there's so many steps to this on providing uh, a tech or um, a type of a type of intervention, the sustainability of that and the impact of that over time. And so this is a, one of those scenarios where I thought to myself, gosh, there's so many steps here that need to be, um, that we need to really talk about in order to create the impact in such a remote area. And so I thought about what are some of the main limitations here? Some of the main limitations are remote infrastructure, limited therapeutics, and that's usually just availability or access to those therapeutics staff shortages. We've seen this more and more now than ever before, and this has always been a problem in the, the world of global health, but the number of patients usually far exceeds the number of staff, um, and, and even now more so than ever, we've seen that to be a problem. Absent health tech. Um, the access to health technology and the access to continuing medical education continues to be a problem in many parts of the world. So what are some of the practical solutions from the field that I believe that uh, are probably a good summary of a lot of what we've talked about in the last two days? So first of all is you know, innovation, innovative infrastructure, finding government funding. This picture to the uh, left here is a hospital that's being constructed in Syria. Um, it's an extension of a ho an existing hospital by MedGlobal and local NGOs. So working together with local government, local nonprofits to find the funding as well as the, the resources to build. And that's just the brick and mortar that we're talking about. Um, the second thing is to get innovative about how we expand infrastructure in other ways. Isolation hospitals were one of the really big things that came out of COVID and thinking about how to increase the number of beds, but outside of a hospital, how do we offload the healthcare systems? Because while the tech is important, and while the open source to the design is important, we have to be able to understand the landscape in which we are applying those things. Um, if we don't have enough beds, then the number of oxygen generators built is not going to be able to fill the tanks because we don't have a place to put those tanks because we don't have a place to put those patients. It, it, everything goes from A to Z when, when we talk about patient care and patient outcomes. 
And so isolation centers across the globe were a really big way to offload hospital systems. We did this in Navajo Nation in New Mexico as well. Um, and this was a great way to say, let's put patients who maybe only need one to two liters of nasal cannula oxygen, um, and let's treat them in a place where we can really task shift and bring folks that can check basic vitals, consult with medical personnel, and take care of patients that are on the low key, low acuity side. Innovate other innovative methods of delivery of healthcare. So using the tech, using the innovation that we're talking about here, and then applying it to very remote areas in a different manner. We have mobile health teams in many of the organizations I work with, um, thinking about how to transport innovative ways on how to transport medications in the top left um, inset of the image at the, on the left side of the screen is the uh, portable um, ice box that we needed to transport COVID vaccines across um, the Navajo reservation. And thinking through those innovate, that innovative design on how we can deliver healthcare across the globe with the input of folks in those communities is incredibly important. Sustainable donations. We've talked a lot about uh, the innovations that organizations come up with, um, that entrepreneurs come up with, and how to actually make those donations sustainable, whether it's machinery, whether it's um, tech itself, um, whether it's uh, just a concept. How do we make these donations or how do we make these collaborations and, and implementations and inventions sustainable? Um, certainly thinking through um, building infrastructure from the bottom up. So uh, Med Global has worked on donating oxygen generators, oxygen, oxygen plants, and then teaching folks locally how to use them, thereby dealing with the concept of repairability, um, management, and, and ensuring that local staff know how to use this tech and can therefore supply over the long term and be a sustainable solution. Augmenting access is another really practical solution that we've looked at, um, installing internet to improve uh, communication across the globe so that there can be ongoing knowledge sharing about those open source designs, about how to implement them. Um, and as you'll see here to the right is a poster from a conference that included doctors from across the globe to share how we're using our different types of tech. And that was only done by the ability of installing internet and really focusing on how that can be a part of, of the A to Z sort of timeline um, and approach to open source design to then impact and implementation. Localizing supply chain, this has been talked, um, talked about a lot. One of the things we did in Bangladesh, as you'll see on the left, uh, this was a task shift of an entire organization with they're actually, the edge is a um, architectural organization um, and they mostly work on building construction and building architect, uh, building architecture. And they basically task shifted into the, into the area of building and creating medical ventilators based on open source design. And so uh, I was involved in consulting on that. And that was an incredible way that that organization was able to say, you know what, we're not building buildings right now. So let's, why not build ventilators and help our people in our country? It's a local organization, local company in Bangladesh. And so there was incentive for them. Um, localizing supply chain became a huge thing when it came to oxygen generators. Uh, organizations were just task shifting left and right in Bangladesh to be able to support the people uh, in the country. And that was an incredible thing to see. Um, but definitely um, standardizing that so that when the next pandemic happens, which, you know, let's be realistic, that's a very real possibility that we have a way to respond and that organizations know how to do that and how to make that sustainable. Which kind of leads me into task shifting and capacity building. This was a huge area um, that was implemented over time when we thought about how do we staff these isolation centers? How do we bring these innovations to the ground with a staff shortage, which is one of the barriers that we talked about? And that was bringing community health workers, family members at the bedside, teaching them how to use the pulse ox, teaching them how to apply oxygen, um, and, and really utilizing um, many people who were currently out of work because of the pandemic, bringing them in to really help be a part of the team. Uh, of course, thinking about sustainable ways to do that over time is incredibly important. So then we go back to the slide of concept to impact. What does that really look like? How do we break that down? So on the concept side, I think about access to the open source design, the designs themselves, identifying grants and funding, 
engagement of local and national government and NGOs, localizing the supply chain in the short and long term. And I think really thinking about how we can involve the local community in that, innovative infrastructure planning, inputs of local healthcare community is incredibly important. They have to be a part of the conversation. And then over to the side of impact, how do we implement? So first starting with implementation of infrastructure, task shifting, capacity building, ensuring that training is a big part of this, continuing medical education, localizing maintenance and repair, monitoring and evaluation of efficacy is hugely important because that feeds back into identifying grants and funding and proving that what we're doing works. Uh, and then at the very end of that, which is probably one of the most important things is the improvement in patient outcomes, which comes when we see that collaboration of both sides of this of this slide. So I'll end here. Um, I know we were limited with time, um, but I really wanted to have this opportunity to tie in the clinical impact of what we've been talking about for the last two days. Uh, I really wanna open it up to questions or comments um, and happy to, to join in on, on any discussions. Thank you very much. Um, you're getting a lot of kudos here. Um, Dale Doherty uh, from Make Magazine says, what a terrific presentation and presenter in the chat. Megan says, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, Reggie Nakin says, great work for sharing. 